We're gonna get started. I know people are gonna trickle in, but one of the things that we talk about a lot is data, right, and the power of analytics. And there's really nobody better than Lori to talk about all of these things. I think one of the things that we do is typically see what's happening with user activity and work backwards in terms of what we're seeing and how that can affect behavior. And she's gonna talk about how to start looking forwards in that activity and kind of decode digital body language. She is, has 15 years of experience in the space and on top of that is an author and currently serves as the Director of Digital Learning for Scotiabank. So without further ado, and to who is much better teacher than myself, Miss Lori Hoffman. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, good afternoon and thanks for coming out. So I'm here to talk to you about a concept that I started with that's called data-driven learning design. And data-driven learning design was something that actually uh, occurred to me when I was dealing with a stakeholder that I want to say they were challenging, but challenging in a really good way. They were somebody who was really concerned with metrics and with data. And as we were pitching them learning solutions, and I'm sure you've been in these types of conversations, they were pressing me for reasons, well, why are you recommending a video here? Why are you recommending um, a drag and drop here? Why are you doing these particular things? And it occurred to me that actually I, I, I didn't know other than intuition um, and 15 years of learning and development experience, but I didn't have something that particularly that would back it up. And that was when I started uh, thinking about data-driven learning design. And probably the best way to think about it is a diagnosis versus an autopsy. Sorry for the gruesome uh, image here. In L&D, we do a lot of autopsying. Um, but let me start with this story. So say you wake up one morning, you have a terrible headache, and uh, you say, okay, I'm gonna make an appointment with, with my GP. You go in and you know, the GP looks at you and says, yeah, absolutely, it looks like you, uh, you have a headache, you're, you look pretty pale, and you're telling me you have a headache, so we're gonna give you some tablets and see how that goes. In a lot of ways, that's often what we do in L&D. Somebody comes to us with what they feel is a learning problem, and we do something, and then we measure at the end to see what happens. Now, I know we do performance consult, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, um, but also, too, there are times for some of us who say are on the vendor side where we don't often even have the advantage of having that deep performance consulting conversation because we might, in that case, be turning away business and we don't want to do that. But when we think of this diagnosis versus autopsy, let's look at some of the things that we actually autopsy on. And I'm sure you've seen these before. We look at completions. We look at our level one to four evaluations, and then we hope that we've gotten some ROI that we're able to demonstrate. And when we do that, though, the problem is, is often this is much too late in the process. Your patient, as I mentioned before, is dead, and you're cutting them open and seeing what happened. So the level one and two, again, it's too late. You've already put your, your course out there or your, your learning asset. It's costly to redesign. If you make a decision to say, wait, this didn't hit the mark, maybe I need to go back, that costs a lot of money to do. And I think this latter one, and this is often why L&D sometimes doesn't get the uh, affection, shall we say, that it deserves, is there's reputational risk. If we put out something that didn't hit the mark, we hear about it, and then it becomes doubly hard for us to get them to engage with the next piece of learning content. It also has questionable accuracy, with some of the data that we get out of the autopsy. You know, the room was cold, the food was not tasty. We hear all of that on, on, our, um, on our evaluations. So what to do? So question to you, raise your hand. Have any of you ever redesigned a learning asset, a complete digital asset based on learner feedback? Have you ever gone back and fixed it? Okay, some of you are saying yes. And how much time and money did that cost you? A lot, and I think some of the ones, I, it's hard for me to see, but I think some of the ones who are nodding are ones who are probably on the client side, um, so you probably had to eat that cost. We don't want to be in that position. As I mentioned before, I know a lot of people say, but we performance consult. And you know what? That's absolutely true, but performance consulting is a skill that I think I would say, A, it takes a lot of time to do it properly, B, we don't always have the resources at hand or are able to do the types of performance consulting conversations we have. And also C, not everybody does them well, right? And when I think of performance consulting, 
there's actually a short video that I'd like to show you. And this video came to me, um, it's actually from the show Silicon Valley. And I'm very excited that we're going to be hearing uh, Dan Lyons speak tonight. Um, this is actually a clip from it. For those with delicate ears, I've uh, bleeped out the bad words. But I think when you listen through it, and it's just a quick uh, one minute, you'll be able to see uh, what happens when you try and do some performance consulting, and then you have the uh, vendor trying to meet those expectations with interesting results. So if we can play the video. We kind of thought we nailed it with tables. But you say you want something light, fun, inviting. But most of all, you want something that delivers a step-by-step -step guide to all of the nuances of your platform. Yeah. All of this with the caveat that you don't have enough money for even a minuscule ad buy. Um, yes, that's right. It's a pretty small target to hit. Anyway, here's what we came up with. What in the name of <laughs> is that? Well, his name is Pipey, the Pied Piper Piper. He's fun. And, uh, you know, the demo's interactive. Just Looks like you want to compress a movie file. Can I help? You know, with Pied Piper's revolutionary neural network optimized sharded data distribution system, it's just six clicks away. Follow me. I like it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look at all a bit familiar. Some of you are laughing, so I won't make I won't make people show, uh, give a show of hands. But this is sometimes what happens, and there is that disparity between what we want to build and what we can build. And, and the fact is, it's an uncomfortable truth for us to realize. But even if we do the best performance consulting we still can be derailed by time, money, or ultimately what a stakeholder wants. Because after all, the stakeholder's paying. So what data-driven learning design is about is how to change some of that conversation to be able to do the things that we know will work and to be able to give some metrics to actually persuade and get our stakeholders to the place where we want them to be. So let's take a look. We'll go a little bit back in time. Uh, when we were dealing in the classroom and we were designing ILT, the facilitator or teacher had a distinct advantage. They could see their audience. They could see whether they were rolling their eyes or crossing their arms or looking out the window or whether they were engaging with the content. And that was a really good advantage because a facilitator or teacher was able to, end to pivot. So if they saw that learners were not engaged, they would maybe put in a pop quiz, ask a question, Johnny, are you on your phone? And get that engagement back. Or if they saw that people were really, really getting it, they could move on quicker to other things and maximize the time in the classroom. Now that we've moved into a digital environment, we've lost that connection. So what happens at that point is in the digital relationship, it's now distant. We don't know what that person is doing on their laptop or mobile when they're looking at our content. Do they have another browser window open because we've lockstepped a module that we forced them to go through? I also say one of my, my key taglines is every time you lockstep a module, a puppy dies. Um, but we don't, know where they, we don't know where they are. And we're not necessarily looking at anything beyond them completing a piece of content. Do they pass the quiz? But what we should be looking at is engagement. And the reason that I say engagement is if people are engaging with your content, that means that you're more likely to have them buy into it and they're ultimately going to be changing the behavior that you want them to change. So that engagement becomes critical for you to achieve the ROI, but we don't often look at it. We look at a completion as being equated with they will do the behavior. And that's, as we said, not necessarily true. But there are things that we can see that happen when we shift to digital, and we'll talk about those. And Two other industries, and well, lots of other industries, and I'm only going to look quickly at two, but two other industries have weathered this disruption um, into digital. So news media and marketing. And the interesting thing with news media is when it first started, as an editor, you were dealing with some pretty simple metrics. You had a 24-hour news cycle, or, or 12, depending if you were a morning and an evening paper. You were really concerned with how many newspapers have I sold. That's it. Pretty easy. You may be looking at what your competitors are doing, but how many do you have in circulation? That used to be the big piece of data. 
You also had a front page news cycle, which typically was, if it bleeds, it leads, right? That's what people want to hear about. You're there to sell, sell newspapers, so that's what you focused on. Q going into um, how digital changed news, news media, now there's real-time metrics on how people are consuming. And they can go minute by minute to pivot and see what articles are being read most often, um, what is gaining traction. They can look at Twitter feeds to see what's happening in advance of them putting something on their, on their news channel. They also, too, can see what their competitors are doing. And the interesting thing about that is this data reveals insights that can challenge our assumptions and what we think. And I'm going to point out uh, three examples. So I often go on to BBC and Facebook, like everybody, and you'll notice that a lot of news sites will now have trending topics, and they'll show you what's number one. Well, here's some pretty interesting number ones that I came across. So um, pregnant duchess taken into, uh, taken into hospital to have her lovely child. That was number two on BBC. And if you look at number one, um, woman takes horse into McDonald's. <laughs> Um, I followed this story, and that actually stayed up for two hours <laughs> as the number one uh, metric, which I found, I found quite amusing. Most read, um, poor Sean Spicer got beat out by a dog that died on Britain's Got Talent. Um, to be fair, it was a very cute dog. Um, and again, this one stayed up for quite some time. And in fact, you know, the Duchess, the royal family, they got beat out again, too, by the dog. So these are, these are from the BBC. And then probably my favorite here is um, trending is a Texas calf resembles kiss rocker Gene Simmons. Um, that beat out uh, some pretty impressive uh, news about the United States Department of Justice. To be fair, it's a pretty cool looking cow. <laughs> if you were a news editor though, before you had these insights, you would have probably gone with what was number two or three as your front page news because you wouldn't have had this data, right? And those are the assumptions that you would, have, you would have made in an effort to sell papers. No editor in their right mind would have said, I'm gonna put a picture of the two cows unless you were maybe something like the National Enquirer. But the fact is, data reveals these truths that challenge what we presume about our learners. And it also explains the Kardashians. And whether or not we want to admit it, in this room, there are people who click on the Kardashians. I'm not going to ask you to out yourselves, but this is the reasons that they trend to the top. But what we have to think about, though, is this is not enough for us in L&D to simply say, well, what learners want, the content, that's what we're going to build more of and we're going to give them more of. That simply isn't going to work because in a lot of times in learning, what we're trying to do is drive a change in behavior. We're trying to nudge them towards a new methodology or a new software platform or to change something about their coaching model that they aren't necessarily doing. So this idea of aggregating coordinated content is not going to help because they're going to, those topics might fall lower on their wish list of items. So in that case, we need to start looking at another place, and this is going to be marketing. And I know we've talked a lot about, about marketing, and marketing, unfortunately, has earned a bit of a, I would say, a bad reputation in, in L&D. And I know this actually from my own metrics. When I blog about marketing and learning, um, my metrics go down and I, I get hate mail. And, um, and hate mail from L&D people is really funny, because they actually write it like, in this letter you will learn, and like they tell me these things. <laughs> And we don't often want to think about marketing because marketing, they're not us. They don't know things like Bloom's taxonomy. They don't know things about cognitive load. So why do we want to pay attention to them? They're the ones with the fidget spinners and the big budgets. But the fact is there are actually a lot of similarities between what marketing and learning people are trying to do. So bear with me on this one. Both of us want to give our audiences information with an intent to change some behavior. Right? In the case of marketing, it is to buy something, and in the case of us, it's to change your behavior or to, to do something new. We also, too, struggle with short attention spans and people competing for their, for their attention. There are multiple things that they're, that they're reaching out to get. And like marketing, that face-to-face -face relationship is gone. If you look at the history, it was people used to engage with a product with a salesperson. There was a handshake. That doesn't happen. Just like in us, we're not in the classroom anymore. We've shifted to digital. And this led me to an interesting tale, which was um, in a previous life, I was building out learning at a company called Eloqua. We were building uh, customer training. And some of that content I actually had the privilege of developing with marketers. And what I found is we had two completely different approaches to content development. 
So we look on the side of learning, which I think is going to look familiar to all of us. We performance consult, create our learning objectives or performance outcomes. Then we engage in our content design and development, which is what we think it should be in order to achieve the objectives. And then we evaluate, very, very linear type process. But if we looked at marketing, I was fascinating and I kind of sat in the room and went, huh, because the first thing they did was not even think about content. They thought of their audience, which we do to a certain extent. But what they did is they went to basically their data analytics engine and they started to find out, okay, that demographic lives in that geography, is going to be that type of person. And they started pulling out how long these people view videos, what time of day are they most active, and started pulling out all of these things that we never really considered. And they didn't even make design choices. Their design choices were already made based on what they saw in the data. And this fascinated me. And the second thing that they did, which was different, is they monitored and pivoted. We don't pivot a lot because it costs us money. By the time we get translation, by the time we go through QA and get it all uploaded again, we can't do that and, and our, our window is passed. They pivot in real time. So if they put a piece of content up and they see metrics trending upwards, they do more of that, drive more engagement. If they see it trending downwards, they, re, they readjust, do something else with the content to see if they can get that engagement to increase. And that's something that we don't do. And it was very fascinating that they could actually then increase the number of people who were going to their content and eventually solidify their pipeline and get more into sales. So what are the things they're looking at in this data? Well, downloads, I can go through all of these. There's likes, mobiles versus desktops, shares, comments, time of day, drop-offs, um, trends. All of these things were pieces of data that they were collecting and, and looking at. And what they were able to pull together is something that I like to call digital body language. So back in the classroom, we had the body language. When we see people online, they're actually telling us a lot of things, but we're not paying attention to what that digital body language actually is. When people drop off or go elsewhere, they're telling us what they like and dislike, but we've only been focusing on the completion. Everything from the amount of time they spend on something to how much they, um, whether they comment or give it, give it a like, are, are all translated into what can, be, what can be called the digital body language. So what does this mean? Well, what if we consider DBL when we made design decisions? And what if we use data like digital marketers do? Our world would look a lot different. And this is when we get into data-driven learning design, which is essentially a three-step process that is quite cyclical. And it's something that I've been doing right now at Scotiabank. And it is, it is fairly simple. So we diagnose which is, uh, as I was mentioning before, that's uh, gathering all the possible data that I can. Discover the insights. Let's look at those insights. What do they mean? And then what, how do I respond to it? And in addition to that, that's constantly reiterating. Now that means I have to ultimately change my operating model as a, as a digital hub or a digital learning hub, where I have to have people on standby who are able to do those adjustments. But it means, though, that we can increase um, engagement and ultimately the, the, the outcomes and results. So let's take a deeper dive into what this means. So diagnose, this is very high level, some of the things that, of data that I do like to pull out. Yes, my LMS, uh, I don't have a great one. If anyone has a great one, let me know. Um, but if I really start digging down into the data that I have, there's a lot more data than you might think, or that comes out on your initial canned reports. And what I was able to find out on mine is I could find things like time of day or week, day of the week that was most active. I could find out what they were logging in on. Um, I could also look at search terms, what are they coming from, and incompletes. And the incompletes are what fascinate me, because the incompletes are people who have gone to your learning and just walked out. So those are the people we want to pay attention because that learning isn't, isn't functioning the way that it should. The other thing that I did was make friends with my IT department. Um, and uh, that was hard. <laughs> but uh, once I made friends with them, I was able to get a lot of data from them that was really quite interesting. So we have um, a social collaboration site. I was able to find out topics that are trending. Top searches, failed searches was a really big one for me. Do I have content aligned with that? Um, because this, these particular sites actually don't connect into my LMS. They're off somewhere else. And again, time of day and day of the week. And then also what I started doing was looking at simple analytics that I maybe wasn't able to get myself. So sometimes um, you can do lots of research on YouTube or Vimeo, and they'll give you analytics on average viewing times. We've all seen those. 
I am going to caution, and I'm going to talk to video times um, at the very end, because this is, can be sometimes a false metric. Um, BuzzFeed, um, that's my guilty pleasure. If you go to BuzzFeed, it's very interesting. You can actually open up their analytics on the end and see, see you know, and they sometimes do A-B testing and marketing blogs. So there's some, sort of some places that I'm, I'm pulling some data from. Then what I do with it is I start coming up with some insights. Now I work at a global company, um, so we predominantly have a footprint in Latin America, and I start to find out some interesting things because insights in the data that I could see, um, there was actually differences in between geographies. And I don't know why those are, I really don't, but I know for a fact, uh, for example, if I put a video in English and the exact same video in Spanish, I will have three times the viewers in Spanish, even though my audience is not proportionally three times more Hispanic or Spanish speaking. Don't know why that is, but it also means that I push out a lot of video in Spanish because I know that that's a, a way that they want to consume. But then I start, in other ways, start seeing some other insights. So again, strong preference for video, most active Fridays at noon, um, most active Monday morning, strong uh, preference for video again, and I start seeing high mobile usage, uh, text format preferred. So I start seeing these things and I can start developing a heat map to make me think about, well, what are, what's the type of content that I want to be putting, I want to be putting out? And then I finally go to respond. So these are some of the things that I do back. So if I see top searches and failed searches, this is the action that I expect my team to take. And I actually have a couple of people who are learning community managers who are monitoring all the different feeds that, that, we, that we have, so our social collaboration site and our LMS. And they will be looking and saying, okay, if we had a failed search, are there things that we need to pull out? Um, is there content that we have aligned with this that we can bring out? And we start promoting it back because we know that's a real-time gap, rather, and, or do we need to actually build something for it? And sometimes that build might be as simple as just going to a subject matter expert and saying, hey, people are looking for this. Can we film you talking about this? Package it up and, and put it up. Very basic. Pages most visited. This is probably one of my favorite. Um, I do try and move things off of my LMS and deep link to it, just because the LMS is challenging. If I see that people are visiting a particular page or a site, I put my content there. And the reason I do that is because if I'm trying to change their behavior, it's doubly hard to now try and get them to go to a new page, look at it, and keep going back to that page. I follow the people, and a lot of this is about following the people. And I, pr I promote the content there. Again, time of day and day of week most active. I have those metrics, and when I publish new content that is not compliance, that I want people to gravitate towards, I use that window of opportunity because I know that I'm probably going to get a 10 to 15% more engagement with it because people are already looking at it. There's one uh, particular news feed. They always send me in the morning at 8 a.m. And I love the news feed, but I very rarely go to it because 8 a.m. I'm on uh, the metro. And if you've been to Toronto, ours is underground and doesn't have Wi-Fi. So I just miss out on that. So time of day is actually really, really critical. So you want to be thinking about that and day of the week. If you're in a particular industry, we, I'm in banking, there's month end. You don't put anything out at month end. It's the worst time for them. But yet, I will have stakeholders who insist that stuff goes out at month end because whatever, it's a blue moon. Um, Drop-off rates, again, how long are people consuming things? And we want to make sure that we're lower than that attention threshold. But again, this is a fuzzy, this is a fuzzy metric, and, and, and I, as I say, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And mobile versus laptop, this is a really key one um, because this makes me make better decisions about uh, what media I'm going to do, and I'll tell you more about that in some of the stories. And again, this comes down to a constant circle. So I keep reevaluating and reevaluating. And the more that I do it, the more that it becomes very quick for us to make design decisions because you're not always coming at it once for the first time. You start to see this picture and we already know what's going to work. So I'll share with you three stories about some ways that I have been able to make it, uh, make it work. So this was an interesting one. Um, talking heads, I call it, because I'm from the 80s. Um, so we had a stakeholder who was paying for the video, so naturally he wanted his face to be in the video, talking head, uh, for seven minutes is what he was looking for. And, um, you know, we really knew intuitively that that wasn't going to be a good idea to, to design. So what we did is we went over to marketing and we went over to a couple of other locations and we looked at all the talking head videos that we had. And that was challenging. And we looked at their, to, to collate, but we looked at what their drop-off rates were. And what we found were, people really didn't pay a lot of attention, right? We had 80% drop-off rate by 30 seconds. But conversely, we also have something that we do where people can do testimonial videos. So if they've done a good sale or if they've managed to um, increase a particular score or metric, they'll just film themselves on their mobile, pop it up on one of our social collaboration sites. 
Well, we found that people were viewing those videos much longer. Their attention spans were much longer. Now, if I wanted to think about it, it's probably because people can relate to those. They're not relating to an SVP because they don't know their job, but they can relate to somebody who is, you know, doing, performing the same role that they are, has the same accent that they have, that, you know, understands their world. Um, so we actually went back to the, the stakeholder with these metrics and said, look, if you want people to view you for 30 seconds and tune out, we'll do the talking head video. And he kind of went, oh, I guess I really don't want to do that. And we went with a testimonial. So we were able to shape that conversation. Another one that we did, this is a, a, a fun one, which was a content gap, and I'm sure you have this a lot, where a subject matter expert comes to you and says, we desperately need content on X, people are searching for it. Um, when we did a search on our intranet feed and looked at the statistics, we found that this particular one ranked at uh, number 152. Um, so that tells me that maybe there wasn't at least as much interest as they were saying. But what we did look at is we found that when we had those top searches, we had three uh, search terms that uh, we actually didn't have a lot of content aligned to, so that we had to pivot very quickly and react to those top three. And those three were actually things that were just coming out in the news uh, that day. So that caused us to make some changes. And this is difficult for stakeholders to, to absorb, but when you're showing them the data, it's an easier conversation. And finally, one that is probably quite controversial. This is uh, millennials in mobile. So we had a cohort of graduate interns that were joining us, and we made the decision that because they're millennials, everybody's attached to their phone, we all saw the presentation this morning, we're going to do a mobile site because we imagined that they would be so into this, they would be on the train viewing this, you know, on their way home and on their commutes and on their weekends at the beach. Um, less than 2% use the app. <laughs> and that was a really hard thing and lesson for us. And so what we did is we said, well, we'll do more marketing of it. So we did, you know, more fancy videos. We added avatars. We still couldn't get above that engagement. And when we sat down and talked to a lot of the people, they said, actually, when I'm on my way home, I want to look at Instagram. I want to look at Snapchat. And what we also found out, which is completely on us, is that we um, are the particular company that this was at the learners were actually paying for their own data plans. They were supplied the phone by the company. So nobody was gonna use their own data plan to do something for work. That was an emotional hurdle and an economic one that they weren't willing to leap over. And that was really, that was on us. We should have done this. And when we actually went to um, other uh, areas of the company and we asked them, you know, hey, you have a mobile app, what's your usage? And they're like, well, we couldn't get beyond 2%. I'm like, well, we should have looked at those first. Now. The tale here, though, is not to say we never should have done mobile. I'm going to be very clear about that. We absolutely should, have, uh, should, have, should be doing mobile and pushing the boundaries. But you have to understand the digital body language of the company and the culture that you're building the content for, because it's unique to each. Uh, and we didn't do that in this particular case, and it, it cost us quite a bit to do. So. There are some other data sources and places where you can, you can get some from. I think there's no shortage of what you're seeing from, uh, from David this morning. Your degree platform has an absolute ton of, of stuff you can mine, and I really urge you to have a look at it. It's expanding and growing all the time. Um, XAPI, anybody here using XAPI right now? We're thinking about it, right? Seeing some, seeing some hands. Um, if you can find any of the Tims from Watershed, and there's two of them, because two Tims twice as nice, um, they have some excellent case studies about uh, what you can find out with XAPI. And, and this, this tool fascinates me because, yes, you can use it to track learning, but if you're really also starting to get a little more granular, you can start understanding things like how long people spend on a particular page. And I would love to see the data on how long people spend on the, these are the learning objectives page. I would love to see the metrics because I bet people just click next. Um, but you can also understand too what activities people do, how long they're spending on pages. And if you really start examining that, you can refine your learning down to, to a point that it's the most efficient that it could possibly be and the most uh, engaged with that it can possibly be using that, that, the, the model of data-driven learning design. You can also, too, look within your HR systems. There's a ton of data there. One of the things we hope to do at the end of this year is to go through uh, the back end of our um, uh, HR system to determine for people's objectives and goals, uh, do an analytics on, what's, on what terms are coming up most often, and to see if that matches actually with the content that, that we're producing and what we have forecasted for the following year. Also, to do a retrospect to see if topics that we did a big push on, are they actually appearing as part of their goals, right? And those are the usual things like coaching and, and uh, in, in our case, performance consulting. Is it actually happening? 
The other thing that we do as well is A-B testing, which is something that marketers do. I mean, marketers have this down to a science. Has anyone ever heard the story about um, Target who was able to determine that a girl was pregnant? Yes, yeah, some of you heard that. So they've got that down to a science. They can also, too, with marketing and the way that their engines work, they know the exact length and type of email header that's you know, going to generate a click through. We need to get that way in, in learning. And if this, you think, well, no, we don't really, I can guarantee now that companies like lynda.com or any of those, those content producers, they're doing this already. And they've probably got it down to a, a really, really fine science. And if we want to compete with those, that's where we need to start thinking because they know this. They are thinking like marketers. Cautionary tale about all of this. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at this. I'm Canadian. Um, the average life expectancy in Canada is 81.24 years, and most Canadians like maple syrup, therefore it kills us. Um, it doesn't. So be cautious when you're looking at your data. Dig deeper. Um, see, you know, challenge things. Um, but Absolutely, you do, you do want to be looking at your, your data. But I would also, too, predict, and I've mentioned this before, we'll no longer be measuring learning by completions, but by engagement and sentiment scores. We'll be look, and it will no longer be a metric to say that somebody completed 100%. Maybe the benchmark will be 65. Maybe, you know, or, or it'll be uh, even lower, as long as they're meeting the performance outcomes that they, that they meet. But this is gonna become more critical than just how many bums and seats you had and, and how, many, uh, how many test scores you had completed that achieved your 80%. And this is what I'd like to end with, because I really think that this is only the beginning. Um, how many of you have seen the, the Ryan Learns videos? Ryan, Ryan Learns something, okay, put out by degree, you should watch them. Um, what fascinated about these, everybody talks about microlearning, and microlearning as a trend actually came from this type of thinking, right? We know people on YouTube, they all drop off, they all drop off. And it's true, people do have shorter attention spans, but the trick is for us to recognize why people sit for the length of time that they do so that we can actually make the learning longer and more worthwhile. Because if you look at the Ryan Learn Something videos, by microlearning standards, because they all say under two minutes or whatever, um, they're morbidly obese at uh, 10 to 12 minutes, and some of them are even longer, and yet they have a quarter of a million views. And I've pulled out this metric a lot of times because that tells me it's not enough to just make it shorter, it's to make it more effective and to understand exactly how people were, um, were engaged with it. So the real magic is decoding digital body language to captivate and engage learners. Finally, what I'll close on is um, this was uh, uh, taking uh, a picture that I took off of my, um, this is at the high school outside, um, just down the street from my house. Um, this is on the smoker's bench. <laughs> the kids go after school, you know, kind of like off to the side, you know, where the cool kids hang out. And um, I think it sums it up. This is, there's no, there's no difference. It, it comes down to giving people what they want. And if we don't do that for our learners, they are just gonna click the close button and we're out of business. So it's time for us to listen to this and that's how we're gonna really engage and captivate our audiences. That's that. Thank you. I think there's uh, one at the back there. Uh, hi, great, great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know, you mentioned earlier about how the marketers were able to quite pivot when they published something. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I don't know if the technology exists, but to be able to pivot the learning modality on the fly, right? So if you publish something at 8 a.m., you find out that the text isn't working or the video and then pivot that quite quickly. Yeah, so, sorry, the question then would be, is that, does that exist today? Are you able to do that? Because I think are you we, said you have some people behind the scenes that are trying to... The way that I've structured my team is I do have, I keep that as a contingency in our resources to be able to pivot. So um, we use Workfront, so I contingent in about 25% of their time to be able to pivot. Hi, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I lead the neural sciences for Cargill and digital learning. Okay. And uh, I was speaking to somebody, and this is a question that I had for the previous panel, but uh, I would like to give it to you, that 
how do you measure demonstrated behavior using digitalization? We did one of the world's largest projects in my last assignment with Cognizant, and 80,000 people were covered using variable computing and natural language, and we were actually testing which mail, when, how, with a very subject group. But there are two areas that I would like to focus here. One is calibration of these devices to scientific empirical data is not yet established. If I want to take basic parameters of pulse and dopamine and motivation levels and engagement, that doesn't coincide with the medical data points because that science has not yet come in. Yeah. <clears throat> Second is, how do you work around the classic theory of 70-20-10 with 70% being on demonstrated behavior mm -hmm. and using digital manifest of that demonstrated behavior, feeding it back into curating your program and then developing it in a hyper-personalized environment? Wow, well, that's an easy question to answer. <laughs> okay, so if I think if I understood it co correctly, and I'll start with the, the 70, the 70 10, 20, 10. This doesn't replace 70, 20, 10, right? This is still, this is still the, 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 the 10, this is still operating in the 10%. So they still need to be demonstrating, still need to be practicing. I'm only talking about one small slice. So I'm not, I'm not touching those other things. What I've just been able to find, and this hopefully re relates to your first question, is when we found that we had content where we had higher engagement, people were more likely to do the behaviors. So an example that I like to, like to use, this was out, out of the news, um, is, uh, so there was a guy, he was working at a uh, fast food restaurant, and he was filmed, he was the owner, filmed with his hands deep into barbecue sauce, bare hands, you know, doing all this, and it, disgusting, right? But the company came back and said, but he got 95% on his uh, food hygiene course. So, and when they had subsequent interviews with that guy, which is kind of a yucky moment, um, he wasn't motivated. So it comes down to that's not going to fix motivation, but we do want to have, if we find out what motivates people and what gets that engagement, we have higher likelihood of them being, doing the behavior. No, it does not. It absolutely does not. And you have to look at it by you have to look at it by increments, right? I'm not talking about just using one metric, but it, you have to look at a whole spectrum of them. But it gets us closer because right now we're not looking at those at all. And another question here. Hi, um, I'm from MetLife, and we're just beginning to kind of uh, dip our toe into community managers. Right. Um, and so I heard you mention that you have a couple of people doing, kind of performing that, and that they're monitoring um, your LMS and sites. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And yeah, the theory that we have with that is um, a lot of times people do their curation as a, as a blast campaign. Um, and I look at uh, social learning and social collaboration, the metaphor that I use is it's a stethoscope, not a megaphone. So it's not enough for you to just put content up there and say they'll go to it, they'll go to it. What the community managers do is they're the connectors and they're monitoring how people are engaging with the content. So for example, if they see that somebody posts something on Agile, they might pull in, hey, we've got stuff on our LMS about Agile, or they might connect them with a director who's doing an Agile project. So they start bringing those, those people in. Um, they also, too, will, will curate based on, on what people are talking about. They um, also, too, um, they, they nudge some of our executives to actually go online and do things because uh, that we don't we don't have. So they perform a, a number of different roles, but it's, it's, it's something that they do multiple times a day. Um, they also add authenticity, right? Because what we try and make sure on our, on our social collaboration sites is that it's not canned content where somebody from comms has put together a statement and that what goes on. They are very authentic. There's typos. There's, it's very much so in the moment, um, but that's their, that's their brand and that authenticity is what people gravitate towards. All right, I guess that's it. If you have any further questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, also, too, there's a snack, so we're going to take a bit of a break right now. So uh, fuel up, and we'll see you at the next sessions.